We're, we're in a place in, in Luke that, that Heath has been uh, kind of walking through, and I'm picking up on that. And we are in a place where uh, Jesus has started to talk in parables, where he's not revealing the truth so um, outright anymore, uh, but instead he is um, just just kind of, kind of speaking in a way that only those who are uh, truly interested would begin to really understand. And, and the way you can kind of define a parable um, is to say that it is, uh, is to cast alongside. So, so if you think about a parable, you'd say, hey, okay, it, is, it means to cast alongside. And so uh, when it comes to spiritual parables or parables that Jesus teaches, uh, it would say that it, what the point is is that he would take something familiar um, it teaches something new and, and uh, cast it, put it, put something familiar alongside the truth, right? And so he would take something familiar that people are familiar with and he would put it alongside the truth to help you understand this new truth. For instance, last week, Pastor Heath uh, was speaking on a farmer who had seeds and was throwing them on hard ground and soft ground and grounds with thorns and all this stuff. And, and the thing that was familiar was the farming, but the greater truth wasn't about farming. He was speaking on something greater, teaching something greater. And those that were interested would look at that and would dive deeper into that for, for a greater understanding. Those that were there to criticize um, or uh, de- devalue Jesus would um, kind of take it and, and pass it off as nonsense or, or as irrelevant. And so Jesus began to speak in these parables. And, and, and what you need to understand is one commentator put to understand a parable is that um, when you see a parable, it comes as a picture, that we see it as a picture, we understand it as a picture. But as you begin to look at these parables, they become a mirror where you begin to see yourself, you begin to see your imperfections, you begin to see um, some, some greater uh, meaning for you in it. Now, here's the thing, is you and me often don't like to see ourselves. That it is not, <laughs> amen, right? It is not something that, that we, we enjoy doing, right? It's why you take a family photo and, and, and you look at the photo and you're like, oh, great, here's the family photo. Who is the person that you're really concentrating on in the photo? Right? It is not like, oh, my kid or my wife. No, you're looking at yourself. And the photo is only good if you look good. Right? If you don't look good, it doesn't matter how everyone else's faces are looking. You're deleting that photo. We're taking another one. Right? We don't like to see ourselves. We don't like to see our imperfections. And so often when Jesus would tell these parables, it would incite anger. People would get angry with it. But here's the deal. If you can look at a parable and not get angry, but be honest about who you are in light of it, that that mirror becomes a window in which you get to see God's grace. So in order to benefit and understand a parable, it takes you coming at it with a level of honesty and humility. And so my heart for you this morning as we kind of continue on in some of the parables Jesus shared is that you would come at it with a level of honesty and humility. That you would be honest about who you are and the way your life has been going and and the way you're living. Like no one can read your mind. No one knows what you're thinking. No one really knows where that is, but you do and you have the opportunity to be honest about it. And we also come at it as a level of humility, understanding that... um, Maybe we don't have it all together. Maybe there is something we're missing. Maybe there is a greater truth that's needed. And so that's my heart for this morning, that together we would approach God's word with this honesty and this humility. And so we're in Luke chapter eight, uh, verse 16 through 21 is where we're gonna, gonna be. In, and in reverence to reading God's word, I, I just invite you to stand with me um, as we dive in this morning. <clears throat> Luke 8, 16 starts like this. He says, no one after lighting a lamp covers it with a basket or puts it under a bed, but he puts it on a lampstand so that those who come in may see its light. For nothing is concealed that won't be revealed and nothing hidden that won't be made known and brought to light. Therefore, take care how you listen. For whoever has, more will be given to him and whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has will be taken away from him. This part right here was also recorded um, in Matthew 5 and in Mark 4. And so the Gospels, uh, they all um, are recording what Jesus taught. 
And they kind of prove each other because they all wrote it at different times based on their um, understanding and, and what they heard. And so they say things a little bit different, but they're all reporting the same message. This last part, verse 19, um, Luke has it here, but Matthew and Mark have this same event in a different spot, which we'll dive into a little bit later, but just so you um, know. It says, then his mother and his brother came to him, but they, do not, but they could not meet with him because of the crowd. He was told, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wanting to see you, but he replied to them, my mother and my brother are those who hear and do the word of God. And this is a point where our mother would have come in to the house and smacked us and pulled us outside the house and said, I was waiting on you. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this time. I thank you for uh, this morning and the work that you will do, um, Lord, as we dive into your word. Lord, I ask that you would uh, bring revelation, God, that you would bring clarity, that you bring understanding, you'd bring conviction, God, you'd bring healing, uh, you'd bring salvation this morning. You'd call us into your presence. Lord, that we uh, would leave um, knowing our next steps, knowing our purpose. And Lord, that you'd be glorified by all that's done. In Jesus' name, amen. You can take a seat. So if you heard me preach like a couple times ago, I told you about um, this forced vacation that my wife and my children and I went on to West Virginia, okay? And as... Terrible as some people make West Virginia out to be. It was actually pretty legit. Um, it wasn't bad, but, but it was because the hurricane was supposed to be coming and my wife was like, your kids can't swim. And I was like, you're right. And so then we went and paid a non-refundable deposit and then the hurricane didn't come. But we're like, all right, I guess we're in West Virginia now. So like, let's just enjoy the moment. And so it, we were there, but it was kind of rainy. Like it was a rainy season and, and it was kind of foggy. And so there's a couple clear days, but we were kind of getting tired of being trapped in this cabin all week. And so we decided to be creative and we found a way to take our vacation underground uh, to the Smoky Hole Caverns in West Virginia. And so we thought, man, this will be kind of a cool adventure. Here's a picture actually um, from us in the caverns. And so uh, that's me holding uh, my then almost three-year-old and then my, that's my wife. And she's the one that was standing, singing in the middle that definitely uh, married down that one where you're like how did that guy get that girl I have no idea but I tell her every day you lost okay and I won um, <laughs> I just rub that in yeah I married up uh, so that's my wife she's she's holding our uh, almost one-year-old daughter and it was a really cool experience walking through this cave and they got this stalactite which is just like this weird smooth rock and and it's supposed to be formed over I don't know cabillions of years and and it it was a pretty neat thing though and just walking through we get down to the like the middle the deepest part of the cavern and the lady said okay we're gonna turn the lights off now to show you how dark it really gets in here and I was like great I have a three-year-old that freaks out when the electricity goes out in the middle of the day so this is gonna be fun um, so I pick him up, I'm like prepping him and I'm doing the insane parent thing of like, no, extreme darkness is so cool. Like you're going to love it. <laughs> like, yeah, I can't see my face either. And so she, she turns off the lights and she begins to share, uh, s some really cool facts about, uh, that like if you, if you stayed in darkness for so long, you would, you would actually die. Um, if you, uh, don't see light for, I think it's like around three weeks or so, um, you actually become blind, which really when you apply that, put a spiritual lens over that, it's really interesting that those who have uh, been sold out to the darkness for so long become, lose the ability to ever see light. Look, you think about Romans 1, it was they hardened their hearts, he gave them to their ways, and, and they chose darkness, and it came to a spot in their life where they could then never uh, see light. And so it was this really interesting time as I'm trying to uh, like make darkness exciting for my child and, and she's telling all these like really deep facts that I'm like, wow, this, wow, Lord, like you are in creation. This is amazing. And then, and then per usual for my life, <laughs> I smell this pungent yet 
familiar smell. Um, and I was like, Nolan, that's my wife's name. I was like, was that you? And she then tried to hit me in the dark, but it was dark. So I was like, hey, let's back up. We're with the tour, right? Where there's a group of people, right? Like there's, there's a lot of people. And I was like, hey, let's like kind of back away from these people. Like, come with me, that smell. And, and, and you need to understand that in a cave, there's no wind blowing. Like the definition of linger is, is, it was lingering. And I was like, hey, like, let's back away from, somebody's not having a good day here, okay? So then she's like, okay, we're gonna turn on the light, turn the lights back on. And, uh, and then I saw with clarity, uh, the tragedy <laughs> that had happened to my daughter's clothes. Because in fact, the stink mom was strapped to my wife's back. <laughs> and, and I realized like everyone else was also grabbing their family members just looking at us like, like it ain't us, you know? And, 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 and we still had a whole tour left. Um, but, but like good parents, we brought a change of clothes and a diaper and a diaper bag and we left them in the van above ground. So we went through the tour, right? And, and when I saw the people's faces, I was like, lady, we could just turn the lights back off. That was more enjoyable uh, than this. And then I began to think like, Jesus, I know you say you're coming back like a thief in the night, but this would be a good time now if you came... <laughs> back, man, what, what really hit me is that like, that's our, our natural reaction in darkness, not the blowout, not that, but, uh, <laughs> but the confusion, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, it was gonna be a good morning, guys. It's gonna be great. Um, no, but in darkness, right? Like that's our natural reaction. Like, it doesn't have to be taught. It's not a cultural thing. It's not hereditary. Um, it's not something that, that you have to be old enough to discover. What, what happens in darkness is, is always confusion. What happens in darkness, it, there's, there's always uncertainty. It's a universal feeling of fear that comes through darkness. The concealment, confusion, it happens in darkness universally. Like you don't ever have a kid at night that's crying because there's too much light, right? They're always saying, no, it's too dark. Can you crack the door more? Can you turn on the light? Can you plug the night light in? Like it's always a cry for more light, never a cry for more darkness. That it is something that happens to us naturally. That we see uh, unclearly in the dark, but then on the other side, that, that naturally with light, there's always a level of certainty that comes with it. There's always a level of clarity, there's always a level of reassurance, and there's always a level of honesty that has to happen in the light. That light forces honesty. That light forces reassurance that light forces clarity, good or bad clarity, when things are brought into the light, you see them. You understand how the situation is when it comes into the light. You also understand the feeling of reassurance of knowing where everything stands in the light. And so when we come to God's word, it, it's no wonder that Jesus would would call himself the light of the world. It's no wonder that when Jesus came, he says, no, I, I need you to understand that I am the thing that will bring clarity. I am the thing that will bring reassurance. I am the thing that will bring peace and hope. I am the thing that will bring honesty that against me, you will see everything clearly. It's no wonder. And it's no wonder that then he says, and those that follow me in their walk with me, right, will be called children of the light, will be light of the world themselves, will have the light in them. In fact, in Matthew 5, where Matthew records this same section, he says, you are the light of the world. He's talking to, Jesus is talking to believers, and Matthew records what Jesus says, and he says, those who follow me, those who trust me, you need to understand, you are the light of the world. That in a place that's really dark, in a place that's really scary, in a place that's really fearful, you have been given an unextinguishable light 
pursue your faith in me. You're a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Unable to be hidden. That you're a beacon of light into the dark places you go. And so in Luke, he continues on the same theme and the same thought. He says, and no one after lighting a lamp, no one after lighting a lamp covers it with a basket or puts it under a bed, but instead they put it on a lampstand so that those who come in may see its light. You understand that Jesus is speaking to believers or to future believers, and he's telling in parables that those that would be curious would dive deeper in. And here's what he's saying. He's saying, hey, here's my desire for the light I've placed in you. It's not that it would be put under a bed or under a basket. It's not that it would be covered up. And instead, it would, it would be put on a lampstand so that those who come into contact with you would then experience the same level of hope and of clarity and of reassurance assurance about their life that you have about yours. It's what happened when you came to know Jesus, in fact. That if you think about the moment that you placed your faith in Jesus, you could describe it as a light that was flipped on in your life. That in a moment, in that instance, you go back to that time, to that place where you saw your sinfulness. You saw your depravity. You saw your need for something better. And what you also saw in that moment in the midst of that light that came on was you saw God's glory. You saw his power. You saw his overarching control of our world. You saw his hand. And then what you saw in the the moment of that light was you saw his response to you. You saw grace. Grace. And you saw forgiveness and you saw unconditional love and a light of hope and of peace and of salvation was put in you. That is, you came to a saving faith in him. He says, and my desire for the light in you is not that it would be hidden. It's not that it would be uh, pushed aside, but it would be made much of, that it would be a necessity There was no electricity, so the lamp and the lantern he's talking about is something that was the source of light for the room. He says, and the light I put in you is is to be that way, but here's the problem. There's a reason that Jesus had to say this because our natural tendency, I feel, in this world is not to put our lamp on a lampstand, but instead to do the very thing he says when it comes to the details of our life. See, what I feel like we have is we have a safety blanket. And in our safety blanket, we carry this around with us whether you know it or not. That you always have it. And what ends up happening, right, is you get to the details of your life. I don't believe there's a lot of you that are walking out of here that on Sunday you claim to be a Christian and you walk out of here and you say, no, I don't really know Jesus anymore. Like, I'm not about that. I don't think there's any of you that are completely living a two-sided life. But I believe that there's a lot of you, including myself, that we carry a safety blanket with us. And what happens is, is we have the light of life that's been placed inside of us. But when things get inconvenient, our natural tendency is not to keep that thing on a lampstand, but it's instead to bring the basket, to bring the bed, to cover up the light and say, man, not this moment am I going to live for Jesus. Like, I mean, it's as simple as thinking about your last experience at a restaurant. When the order took forever to come out and you had to make a choice, am I going to represent and live the way Jesus would live in this moment or am I going to throw the blanket over? And then the order came out, right? And it was wrong. And you're like, okay, there goes your tip, right? Like, that we pull this, we pull this out. If you're Pastor Heath, apparently it's like every day on the highway you get cut off. <laughs> I think y'all are just doing it on purpose. Like you see him, you're like, watch this. Hear about this on Sunday. <laughs> but that we have, I don't believe it's just the big things. I believe it's in the little details of life. For me, man, I, the Lord put this on my mind this week and I can, can't tell you how convicting it's been. That I'm dealing with my kids and, and I'm like, man, just go to bed. And he's like, man, I just need one more gl- cup of water. And I'm like, dude, you're gonna, the bed's gonna be like a water bed. And I'm more like, no, we can't. 
just go to sleep. And my whole reason for getting angry is not that he needs something. It's that I want to go watch a TV show by myself. Right? It's, it's the little things where I'm like, man, in this moment, in this moment, am I going to let my light shine? Or in this moment, am I going to throw it off? And some of you are actually dealing with bigger things. Where it comes to your marriages. Where it, where it comes to your workplaces. It comes to that neighbor who plays loud music at night and often wakes your kid up. That you say, ah, uh-uh, man, like, let's cover that up well. Because this is about to get nasty, right? Like... But for real, some of you in here have kids who would even attest and say, my parents are different people on Sunday morning. That who they are on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday, unless they come to the Saturday night service, are different. What you need to understand is I get to see the product being in student ministry of that parenting style. An inconsistency where this blanket comes off and on and off and on. And the parents who live different Monday through Friday than they do and, they, and then they act on Sunday morning are parents who have kids who often claim atheism by the time they're 18. I can't even tell you how many times I've seen that. Because what you've communicated is that the power of Jesus is really just a hobby. It is not a relationship. It's just something we kind of do to make us feel good. And Jesus says, no, no, this is not my intent for you. My intent is not that in the details of your life, you would cover it up, that in the inconveniences of your life, you would use your safety blanket. My, my, my plan for you is that in the inconveniences and in the details of your life, often when you look in scripture and even when you look in your own testimony, likely, it is then that when your light shines in those inconveniences and in the little details of life, that the greatest movements for the gospel are made. That when we go above and beyond for that waiter and then they ask Why? even though they screwed everything up. Then when we continue to have patience and grace with our kids, not a lack of discipline, but patience and grace, that we see people who grow into adults who love Jesus and make a huge impact for this world. See, it's in the little details that I think it really matters the most. If we're using the safety blanket or if we're not. And here's the truth. Jesus goes on in his... And, and what he's saying here, he says, for there's nothing that is concealed that won't be revealed and nothing hidden that won't be made known and brought to light. And so what he's saying is, man, we have a light in us and, and sometimes we have this tendency to want to cover it up or to reveal it when it's convenient or whatnot. But you need to understand what Jesus is saying is that, hey, whether you cover it or not, the light will shine in this world, that I will return, that the gospel will be made known, that every shadow and every dark spot will be brought into the light that there will be no mystery, that all secrets will be permanently revealed, that all mysteries will be permanently known, that there will be glory to God because his light will shine. He says, so therefore be careful how you listen. The literal term for that means be seeing what you are hearing. Be seeing what you are hearing actually taking what is being said and applying it to your life, see how it's lived out and then put feet to that and begin to live that out. Be seeing what you are hearing. What he's saying is the gospel does not depend on you. You can take the pressure off. The gospel doesn't depend on you. That God is bigger than me. God's bigger than my mistakes. God's bigger than my apathy. God's bigger than my comfort zone and my inconveniences that I could cover my light up and say, man, I'm just gonna deny Jesus the rest of my life. Salvation would come into question whether I truly was following Jesus or not. But the gospel and light would come into the world that it doesn't depend on me. But what he is saying He's saying it doesn't depend on you, but here's the deal. You have an opportunity then to be a part of the greatest story ever told. 
that you have an opportunity. He's saying, man, I've given you a light, not that it depends on you, but I wanna give you an opportunity to be a part of something much greater and much bigger than yourself. I wanna give you an opportunity to, to make an impact in this world that truly matters, that goes far beyond just 100 years or 20 years or 70 years or however long you live. And then however long people remember you after that. He says, man, I want you to make an impact far greater than that. I want you to make one that lasts for an eternity. That's thousands and millions and billions of years. Because of how you shine the light of Jesus in you and the hope you have to the darkest spots of your life, to the darkest places and people's lives. See, that's what he's saying you have an opportunity to do. That you have an opportunity through your relationships with the people around you. You already know who they are. They're your coworkers, they're your neighbors, they're your family, they're your friends. You have the opportunity to go to the deepest and darkest places of people's lives where they feel fear and they feel hopelessness and they feel unsure and they feel uneasy and they feel lost and they feel scared. And you have the opportunity to flick a light on, to bring Jesus there to preach about the hope and preach about the love and preach about the peace and preach about salvation to them in those deepest, darkest spots where a light comes on and they begin to see with clarity their situation and who Jesus is and his response to them. He says, man, I'm giving you an opportunity to go to the caverns of people's lives and be a light. You know what's interesting about the caverns? Is when they flipped the lights on, I began to kind of look at the lights. Can I tell you how nasty those lights were? They weren't LED or HID. They were like the oldest, dankest lights, right? They were so gross and so dirty. They were so small. Half of them were like barely hanging up on the thing. I was like, kid, don't walk underneath that, right? Like any time now, they're gonna come down, right? And the, these lights were, were old, but yet when they flicked on, they lit the cavern up clearly, we could see them. See, Jesus isn't calling for the, for the person who's the cleanest light and the greatest light and, and has all the answers, He's saying, man, I'm just calling you in, in where you are and in your past and, and with the future I have planned for you just to be a light in the place you're at right now. We get so caught up in that. The I'm not good enough. How do you know my history? Do you know the words I said as I was stubbing my toe walking in here? Like, he doesn't care. Like those are things that obviously Jesus is going to be sanctifying and, and working in your heart on. But he's saying, man, I'm not calling perfect people. He says, man, I died for sinful people that you may know perfection. And I'm calling you to show the love of Jesus to the places you're at and to be a light in the dark spots of people's lives and the details. Matthew 5, it says, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. And there is no greater purpose that we're tempted to follow our hobbies and our jobs and our relationships to try to find purpose. And they are shallow imitations that they leave you constantly hungering. He says, man, you wanna find purpose. I'm telling you purpose, that I've saved you for a purpose. I've saved you so that you would be a part of the greatest story ever written. He says, for, and here's the promise he has. He says, for those who, uh, who, for whoever has, more will be given to him, and whoever does not have, even what he thinks he have, has will be taken away from him. So what you understand, back in the day, they had lamps or lanterns that it was like a dish, and in the dish they had a wick, and you would pour the oil in, and they had a floating wick in this oil, and you would light the wick, and as the, as the oil wicked up the wick, it would begin to burn the oil. And so as they were watching this lantern that was giving them light in their house, as the oil would go down, they would add more oil to it. Now there's the lanterns that weren't being used. What they didn't do to the lanterns that weren't being used was continue to add oil. In fact, they would empty the oil out of those and put them in lanterns that were being used. And what he's saying, he's saying, hey, whoever has, more will be given to them. Whoever is using resources and using energy and trusting in the Lord, trust me that I will sustain you. He says, but the world wants to make promises that Jesus says only he can fulfill. You need to understand that about Jesus' promises. 
that any promise Jesus makes, he says, hey, these are promises that only I can fulfill. That the world is gonna try to tell you they can fulfill the same promises that Jesus can make, but you need to understand they can't. And if Jesus says, I'm promising to sustain you, then you need to understand that anything that the world says that they can sustain you in cannot. That the world cannot fulfill the promises of Jesus. They just can't. They're promises that only Jesus can fulfill. And he's saying, hey, I can sustain you. I will sustain you. There's people that think they have life and they think they have it figured out and you need to understand even what they think they have, they will lose because life comes through me. And as you continue to step forward, as you continue to trust, you need to understand that I will continue to give you more. It is this thought that you cannot outgive God. You cannot outspend God. You cannot outuse God. That God will use you and, and provide for you where needed. So often we allow our schedules and our bank accounts and our talents or the talents we don't have to be the limitations on what we choose to do for God. God is saying, no, no, you need to understand that I am the great sustainer. That it doesn't mean you may stay at your current place of living. It may mean you drop way down, but you're gonna be, but you're gonna be okay. But I will give you what you need. And you need to understand that he's not even making promises for temporary life here on earth. He's saying eternally, nothing's gonna separate you that I will sustain you, that I will provide for you. But that's a big thing. That changes the refocus and what we are concentrating on and what, we are, what, what our goal is in life. Are we seeking eternal gain or are we seeking temporary earthly gain? He says, man, I, I will sustain you. What this also says and what you gotta also understand about that is that not everyone when seeing your light will take kindly to it. That it's like in the morning, if, if it's early in the morning and you got a spouse, that, like a husband or a wife that just turns the light on right away and then like very unlawful thoughts come into your mind like about what needs to happen in the moment and you're like, do you turn that light off? And it's painful that a lot of times the people who you are going to walk up to and share the love and the hope of Jesus with, they are not okay with it. That darkness is where they've gotten comfortable and so you need to understand that not everyone is going to be cool with that and be okay with that. But he says, even in, even in the hard times, even in the, in the times where you are rejected, know that I will sustain. Know that I will fulfill. He goes on as we um, close out. He says, then his mother and his brothers came to him, but they could not meet with him because of the crowd. He was told, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wanting to see you. See, Luke puts this after this parable of the light. Matthew and Mark, they put it after a different situation. And Matthew and Mark, they put it after Jesus heals a man on the Sabbath and then casts a demon out of a demon-possessed man. And then this large crowd is following him because he's healing people on Sabbath and he's casting demons out. And they're like, what's this guy gonna do next? He comes into a house, he interrupts a dinner and a whole group and crowd of people are in there. And then people start accusing him of being demon-possessed. His parents hear about this in Mark 3. It says his parents hear about this and they think, or his mother and his brothers hear, and they think he's crazy. And so in an effort to restrain him, an effort to restrain Jesus, they go to the house and it's too crowded and they can't get in. And so someone says, hey, Jesus, your mother and your brother are outside wanting you to come out. You need to understand that, that it's in these situations in our life, whereas you choose to put feet to the things that you are reading and hearing, that the people around you, even some of the closest people around you, aren't gonna understand what God is calling you to do. They aren't, they aren't gonna understand what's going on. I can't tell you how many people, when I was, I, I went to school to be a police officer and, and then the Lord called me in the ministry. And so people would say, hey, there's this cop job over here if you want to apply. I said, no, no, I'm actually doing ministry at the church. And literally, I cannot tell you how many times people said, hey, it's okay, man. You're going to find a real job soon. <laughs> And I was like, I'll show you a real job. Put the blanket back on, right? <laughs> but people didn't understand. 
It was in those times where I had to decide, okay, who am I gonna listen to? The people closest to me that are saying, dude, this isn't really where it's at. You, this is not gonna provide, this is not gonna work. You've gotta go somewhere else. That it's in those times where the Lord calls you to either quit a job or to take a job, that the Lord calls you to sell a house or to buy a house, to move or to stay, where the Lord calls you to spend or to save, where the Lord calls you to serve in ways maybe that you've never thought about, like middle school ministry on Sunday mornings at 9.30. (laughs) Conviction. I'm joking, but seriously. Um, It's in those moments that the people closest to you begin to doubt you, that you are going to be most tempted. Most tempted to say, man, okay, God, maybe this isn't it. Maybe this isn't right. Where's my blanket? Where's my, maybe I need to cover up. Maybe I need to, like, I don't know about, is this gonna work? That it's in those moments, and and I love, Jesus says, he, he totally rewrites what our perspectives should be. He says, but he replied to them, my mother and my brother are those who hear and do the word of God. Growing up in in a Christian home and at church, often I heard, hey, if you're feeling far from God, go read your Bible. Hey, I'm just kind of doubting God. I don't know. Hey, just go read your Bible. Okay, uh, but I, I I haven't heard, just go pray. Hey, go read your Bible and pray. That's like a dual combo. Like it'll always work. Like, go read your Bible and pray. Just go do that. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard that. But here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying much more than that. He's saying those that hear, which means those that get into God's word, who read God's word, who read their Bible, those who speak to God, who pray, who hear God's word, who come and who worship and hear God's word. But then he says, and those who do, who hear God's word and do are those that feel as close to Jesus as a mother or a brother. He says, those that are close to me are those that are not just hearing God's word and going on about their life. He says, it's those that are hearing God's word and are doing and are acting on it. See, you come in here often and the Lord may convict you and speak to your heart. The question is, do you allow it to change your routine and your habits when you walk out of here? He says, it's those who hear and who do or who are like mother and brother. He says, the ones that I'm gonna listen to, the ones that I'm going to truly follow are those who are hearing and doing, who have God's will at the top of their priority list. It should challenge you to consider who you're listening to. Are the people you're listening to, are the people that are advising you, are the people that, are bouncing, that you're bouncing things off of, are they people who say, man, God's will for your life is at the top of my priority list before my comfort and, and, and my own uh, thoughts on it? He says, man, those who hear and who do. So my challenge then is, man, who are you listening to? And how are you shining a light in the detailed places of your life? Man, if this hits you the way it's hit me all week, I'm really sorry. (laughs) You're gonna have a tough week because every moment you're gonna realize, man, am I pulling that blanket over? Or am I shining the light of Jesus which brings clarity and which brings hope and which brings peace and salvation to a lost and dark world? Let's pray. God, I thank you for this time. I thank you for how you speak through your word. God, in fact, we believe that it is living and active. So God, what was read today, what was spoken today, God, I ask that it would continue to resonate in our lives. That it would bring conviction and like light would bring clarity. And God, for those that are in here that realize they've been in darkness and that through your grace and your mercy, you've given us an avenue through Jesus to enter into a kingdom of light and a kingdom of clarity. God, I ask that you uh, would move them to a saving faith in you. God, may we be a community and a family of believers who live every day captivated and changed by you. 
May we be a beacon of light, a city on a hill. That people find you. Give us wisdom. And give us clarity. Give us understanding on how we need to move forward, God. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.